To see videos like this early as well as other benefits, join me over on my Patreon. Season 1 of Star Trek's first animated show since the 70s finally wrapped up this week. Although Star Trek has veered into animation before, this is the first of a kind installment for the franchise in terms of genre. So after 10 episodes, was it actually any good? Previously I gave my thoughts on the very first episode. I was optimistic, but my overall reaction was mixed with its first episode. The animation itself was generally of a high quality. The characters are imbued with heaps of personality and energy. Oftentimes in other modern animated shows, characters have a bad habit of basically standing completely lifeless and still when they're not talking. But on Lower Decks, the animators have gone to great effort to keep every character expressive and active, even if it's just for the background. Outside of the characters, the show is full of vibrant colours, gorgeous space vistas and cool as hell ship designs. One of the natural advantages of animation is that drawing a human is just as costly as drawing an alien and vice versa for alien cities and human cities etc. This allows Lower Decks to really make the Star Trek universe feel expansive and bustling with life and colour. The new ship designs which Lower Decks has added were also a delight. The Cerritos did I say it right this time, is a perfect evocation of the kitbash background ships which often pop up in TNG and DS9. But on top of that, the Parliament class and assortment of new alien vessels were also really cool designs. What rubbed me the wrong way a wee bit in the first two episodes was some of the humour. The moment Rutherford and Barnes kept going with their date as the crew were literally eating each other was quite jarring and strange. Other jokes which didn't really land for me at first were some of the references and easter eggs. The end of the first episode literally just had Mariner listing off references without any kind of proper punchline. Overall I enjoyed the first episode, but these problems persisted into the second as well. I didn't dislike either one outright, but these issues did stop me from really getting into the show and I anticipated this season being meh overall, but as the next few episodes came out, I slowly started to like it a lot more. Temporal Edict was a really clever exploration of a well-worn Star Trek trope, that of buffer time. Yeah, well I told the captain I'd have this analysis done in an hour. How long would it really take? An hour? Oh, you didn't tell him how long it would really take, did you? Well, of course I did. Oh, laddie. You've got a lot to learn if you want people to think of you as a miracle worker. But rather than just making fun of the idea, the episode managed to really dive into the concept to make some important statements about the Star Trek universe, real life work culture, and further add to the characters. While Captain Freeman sees buffer time as a waste of Starfleet hours, the episode shows us it's a necessary part of Starfleet officers taking real pride in their work and truly loving their chosen fields. It goes far beyond merely referencing something for a quick laugh, and instead turns into a smartly written story. The other quicker references in the show, however, also delivered some solid laughs out of me. The aliens whose entire culture seems to revolve around crystals is a nice jab at Star Trek's habit of creating monocultures, and Ransom managing to win his gladiatorial fight by only using the signature double-fisted punch was hilarious. While it still wasn't blowing me away as a show, it was a noted improvement over the first two episodes. The next four episodes felt like the season was really picking up steam. The writing felt a lot more confident and the story ideas were much more layered in their comedy, themes and character development. Moist Vessel straight up had a really cool idea for an episode. The imagery of a starship being terraformed into an alien world from inside was really creative and very visually striking. This is also where we get our first bit of truly sincere character development. Another issue I had with previous episodes was the hyperactive pace, which didn't leave much room for genuine emotion. But here we get a new development in the mother-daughter relationship between Freeman and Mariner, which was really nice. Cupid's Errant Arrow was probably the funniest episode for me personally, where pretty much every joke landed. Watching Mariner run around like a crazed lunatic as she explored her conspiracy theory surrounding Boimler's girlfriend was hilarious, and Tendi and Rutherford geeking out over Technobabble was adorable and amusing as always. Terminal Provocations wasn't quite as good for me. The whole idea behind Badgie is inspired and easily the best part of the episode. However, what irked me a little was the hyperactivity of the Fletcher plotline. The pace was just so fast and the energy always cranked up to 11. I found it difficult to invest in the drama because each plot development was just going by so fast. 
Fletcher's mysterious attacker, the clash with the Delta Shift, and the computer core going nuts, all happening while the bridge crew were dealing with an attack from scavengers, was perhaps cramming a bit too much into the runtime. Much Ado About Boimler was also a mixed bag. I feel like what we learn from Mariner here has already been sufficiently explored in previous episodes. Her remaining a Lower Decks ensign by choice and not wanting to move up the ranks despite the pressure already came up in Moist Vessel, and I think the info here is a bit redundant. That being said, the rescue mission itself or encountering the big space creature was pretty cool. I found Boimler's plot a bit more engaging. Once again, it's a funny send-up of a Star Trek trope. The amount of transporter accidents and red shirts running afoul of alien technology, actually creating the need for an entire division of Starfleet Medical, is perfectly in line with the kind of bureaucratic nonsense and daftness we've seen from the organization in previous Star Trek shows. I feel like the resolution kind of just petered out a bit, and the B-plot of Tendi's dog didn't really get many laughs from me. But overall, it's a good episode. The last three episodes, however, were absolutely brilliant. Veritas, Crisis Point, and No Small Parts showcased all of the strongest aspects of the show up until this point. The comedy was excellent, the references were clever, and the drama was top-notch. Veritas was a fun little anthology of sorts. Each story offered great material to our main characters, as well as the bridge crew. Rutherford's constant blackouts into a Gorn wedding, Tendi accidentally joining a Black Ops mission, Boimler and Mariner messing up as bridge officers, it was all hysterical. Sometimes the joke came so fast, I'd be laughing over some crucial plot info and have to rewind the episode a tad. It was awesome to hear Kirkwood Smith of Robo Cop and Year of Hell fame as a guest star, Clark. His final shouting match with Mariner had me in hysterics. And once again, the nods to The Undiscovered Country and the myriad of other trial episodes Star Trek does were great, making the final plot twist even more amusing. Crisis Point, however, was basically like a mini Galaxy Quest style parody. The sheer amount of jokes and clever parodies of the Star Trek movies are too many to name. The James Horner style score, the never ending sweeping camera around the ship, characters shedding a tear over the beauty of their own vessel, and that's only the opening few minutes. What I especially liked as well was the inclusion of the Kelvin timeline movies in the list of callbacks. The J.J. Abrams lens flares, of course, are there, but some shots from Into Darkness and Beyond were replicated pretty much exactly. The character work here was especially strong though. Mariner literally fighting herself really conjured up some terrific character development. Her two halves, the loyal Starfleet officer and rebellious daughter hashing things out with a fist fight, paid off her arc really well. And the way Tendu, Rutherford, and Boimler all reacted to her spiral of self-destruction was also really well written. Rutherford just wants to thank his commanding officer, and Tendi has no desire to fill an Orion stereotype. Not only did this holodeck adventure enrich the various plot lines which were already going on in the show, but it was actually a pretty engrossing mini Trek movie as well. The only thing which took me off guard was Boimler discovering Mariner is the captain's daughter. Not because it's a crazy twist or anything, but because I just wasn't aware he didn't know. The previous episodes didn't really make it clear that this was a secret that need to be kept. That is, unless I missed something. Either way, Crisis Point was easily my favourite episode of the season, and generally one of the strongest recent Trek episodes in general, only for the season finale to come along and pretty much do it all even better. No small parts basically did what Crisis Point did, but brought with it real consequences. The criticism of Starfleet not doing a good enough job of following up on worlds it's encountered is once again really funny, but also a smart jab at the franchise. Revisiting the Landru planet of all things, and then making the Packleds the main villains was a welcome surprise. In general, it's really clear just how much love there is for Star Trek in the writer's room for Lower Decks. Much like Galaxy Quest, only die-hard fans can make fun of Star Trek this well and this lovingly. Not only was the episode as funny as ever, but also genuinely gripping with high stakes and real drama. Big spoiler warning here, if you weren't keen on the first episode or two, but think the rest looks good, please binge the season before watching more of this video. Okay, here we go. I thought for certain Captain Freeman was going to be killed off. She and Mariner's relationship was only just getting good, and so cutting it short would have been the height of tragedy. But that didn't make it any less devastating when Shax ended up sacrificing himself to save Rutherford. While not particularly complex as a character, Shax was honestly really endearing. His constant calls to action and fire phasers in every single situation were always funny, and it was pretty cool to have a Bajoran embody that kind of character. It was really pretty devastating to see him go, and the preceding send-off didn't cop out with any cheap jokes, but instead played it straight, which was more than welcome. 
Not only that, but having Rutherford lose his implant and memory, as well as Boimler getting a transfer, shows the writers of Lower Decks are a lot bolder than many may think at first. Obviously, Boimler will encounter the Cerritos again somehow, but with these big changes to the status quo, it shows a lot of potential for future seasons. And of course, Will Riker and the USS Titan charging in to save the day, all the while Jerry Goldsmith's theme blared away made me jump for joy. So happy to see, or rather hear, Freaks and Certus reprise their roles once again, and the Luna class officially entering the Star Trek universe was great. A genuine bravo to the Lower Decks team because this was an excellent season finale. So while Lower Decks got off to a bit of a shaky start, it might have actually had a stronger first season than Discovery and Picard, and I enjoyed those a lot too. As the episodes kept getting better, I was more and more pleasantly surprised. I'm now hugely excited for season 2, and can't wait to see where Lower Decks goes next. David Deister asks, do you think the Orville will get a third season? Uh, most certainly. It got the official renewal after all, and according to those who work on the show, shooting is currently underway, albeit delayed because of the pandemic of course. I know there were reports that the Orville was cancelled, which I think would be a real shame if it turns out to be true, but I don't think anything is really confirmed until Seth MacFarlane says it's cancelled. So a third season is a sure thing, I just hope we get more seasons after that as well. Thanks for watching. If you like what I do and want to see more videos, subscribe and hit the bell icon to stay up to date on all my new uploads. If you like what I do and want to help the channel grow, join me over on my Patreon where you can see videos like this early. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.